you're not getting any younger, so... Do, be, and love. That's my thing. Hey, you. Yes, you. Welcome to the You're Not Getting Any Younger podcast, a podcast for people who want to disrupt their lives for a good reason, to make it count. I'm your host, Jen Glantz. And every week, I'll drop a new episode with stories from real people, just like you, who woke up one morning and decided to make big changes, starting with small things. We'll cover topics like entrepreneurship, love, failure, and self-care. Hey, you're not getting any younger, so let's make this an adventure. Ready? What's a job anyway? Something you wake up in the morning and put pants on for? Something you go to every day and sit behind a desk and answer emails and dial into conference calls and answer to your almighty boss? Perhaps it's just a paycheck. Or maybe it's something you've been working hard on for a while so that you could finally do what you've always dreamed of doing. This week's guest, Brian Yenis, set out at a very early age to become a TV reporter. He had a fascination with watching the news while most of us were still watching cartoons. How he went from a broadcast journalism major in college to become a national TV reporter for Fox News is an adventure that involved him standing up for himself, saying yes to doing everything, and a little bit of being in the right place at the right time. Brian's the first male guest on the show, And he's also been one of my closest friends since high school, where he won the senior superlative best all around. And I won the superlative most likely to eat pizza. Just kidding about that. Brian's story is one you haven't heard before. I hope you enjoy. And come join us in the You're Not Getting Any Younger Facebook group so we can talk more about what's happening in your life and how we as a group can make sure you do what you have to do. Because you, my dearest friend, you're not getting any younger. Hi, Jen. How are you? Welcome to Fox. Welcome to my podcast. <laughs> this like- is exciting. Am I the I'm the twelfth person, right? So more exciting is that you are my first male guest. That's amazing. Is yeah. that by design? You know, I was looking for a good guy, and good guys are really hard to find. <laughs> well, that's a topic for another day, I guess. <laughs> you know, I really wanted a guy with an interesting story, and when I thought about who I know, you clearly came to mind. My first question for you is, when you were a kid, Brian, what did you want to become? Well, um, it's a great question. I was, uh, I'm Dominican, so um, I was born with a baseball in my hand and a bat in the other. So, of course, I was supposed to be a baseball player uh, since the get-go. So I was always wanting to be a baseball player until about uh, Mm -hmm. fifth grade when I realized that I really liked watching hurricane coverage on local news. And so I've actually known what I've wanted to do since I was in fifth grade, and here I am doing it, TV reporter. So when you were living in Florida, watching hurricanes on TV, <clears throat> what made you say, wow, I hope one day I get to stand inside of that storm and report about it? I think, um, you, so, you know, we, you and I both grew up in uh, Boca Raton, Florida. So when a hurricane would come, it was very exciting. And for whatever reason, I would come downstairs, turn on the news and watch as nonstop coverage. And it was interesting because my family didn't care. So I would just update them on what's going on. And um, something just drew me in about these people that were out there. It was exciting. The reporters from WSVN, Channel 7 in Miami, were out there in Key West or Miami. And there was just something really exciting about an impending, you know, a storm coming through and um, the reporting of it. And it's something that really caught my attention, like I said, in the fifth grade. And, um, You know, I've been watching news since I was young. I mean, I was the kind of kid that watched 60 Minutes with my mother and my father. Like when I was, I don't know, 11, Peter Jennings was always on in the house. Um, My parents didn't really care about what I watched when I was younger, which (laughs) which turned out well. Uh, So I was always watching sort of just adult television in terms of news and movies. And um, I don't know, I think it, it helped me kind of grow up a little bit faster. 
Another reason why I wanted you to be on the podcast as my first guy is because you are one of the only people I have in this world who have known me for so long. We've known each other for more years than you can count on your hands. You know a little bit too much about me, which is why I'm glad you're not interviewing me for this podcast. <laughs> oh, we can turn the tables if you like. Okay. I mean, <laughs> that scares me a little bit. But do you remember how we actually became friends? Uh, we were in English class in the ninth grade. You were wearing a jean skirt. Is that what they call it? Oh, that's embarrassing. But yeah, that's right. You were wearing right. a jean skirt. You just came from Donna Klein, and you were talking about your your days at the Jewish Academy. Of course, we grew up in Boca Raton, Florida. You know, so it was, uh, and I had just come in from Eagles Landing Middle School, and um, we just started talking. I think you were wearing probably some very colorful shirt. And you were just very welcoming and opening. And I remember specifically a day we were talking about um, a report that we had to do. And I had to talk about why the death penalty was like a bad thing. And we were talking about how this report, you know, sucked and yada, yada. And it was just a hard, hard, hard thing to do. And uh, that's how we became friends. We also had speech class together. Okay, I remember, and then we had yearbook as well. I remember none of this. <laughs> you could you could say, how did you meet Brian? I said, I've known Brian since I was born. I have no idea. But you know what I do remember is how you were in high school, which is so crazy because it's exactly how you are right now. Really? You were so friendly. You always had a smile on your face. What was your superlative in high school, Brian? Oh, don't do this. Yeah. Your superlative was uh, most likely to be famous, yeah. right? Yeah, and yours was best all around. Best all around, which is kind of an interesting thing to be like, okay, so you're not really good at one thing. You're just sort of mediocre at all things, jack of all trades. No, but it was, a, yeah, it was best all around, which was kind of an interesting. No, but you deserve What does it. that even mean? Okay, so in my <laughs> eyes, you were the person in high school who was friends with everybody, which translates now because you treat everybody as if they are royalty. Whether it's the janitor or the principal of the school, even at Fox News, when I've been here with you before, you treat everybody here like they are on top of the world. And that's something that after knowing you for 10, 15 years hasn't changed. I think, um, well, that's a very nice thing for you to say. Um, you know, I just think growing up, mom and uh, mom especially was very much about just treat people the way you would like to be treated. And I think. Um, I had a thing against, I remember specifically in middle school, there were um, a couple bullies, not specifically for me, but for people on the bus that I would take the school bus with. And I remember <clears throat> standing up for them. And I think ever since then, I realized that, you know, and I've, I've been on the other side of being bullied too, where people like said things that I didn't think were nice, but I've always realized and I've always told myself that just keep going, smile, be good. Um, and good things are going to happen to you. But I just I just feel like life is too short. You know, you need to be good to people and you get what you put out there in the universe. And so I just think I've always lived by that. And there's no reason to, to not be kind. I think people remember how you make them feel um, mm. more than anything. And um, I've always felt that uh, as that's that's an important way to live life. You know, um, yeah. make, make people feel good and good things will happen. I came to high school not knowing a single person. So it was so great meeting you in ninth grade and becoming your friend. What was also cool was preparing for this interview, I decided to go back to our Facebook and press see friendship. <laughs> oh, and no. what was really interesting was, I'm really making us sound old, but we're not, but when we graduated from high school, we had cell phones, but we didn't use them obsessively. There was no Facebook yet. We just used them no. to call people. But I saw that once we got Facebook, we were both in college. You went to the University of Miami. I went to the University of Central Florida. And we communicated, I'd say, monthly on Facebook. And all we wrote to each other was, I miss you. I miss you. How are you? How are you? <laughs> and then I, I guess I started to see, okay, he's majoring in broadcast journalism. And then in the summer of 2009, I saw you went to New York because you got an internship at Fox News. How did that happen? Yeah, there, you and I stayed in touch the way I think a lot of people on Facebook used to stay in touch. It wasn't always this thing where you would post a lot of photos. I feel like people would write on people's walls, right? It was like lot. writing love letters. Yeah, it was very but weird. But it really was. It was, it was. And it wasn't like this instantaneous message. The messenger wasn't around. So I, I get that. Um, 2009 was a big year for me. I was at the University of Miami, a junior, and um, I got into this uh, program at the University of Miami that allowed people to come up here for internships in the summer. But the, the kicker was that you had to get your internship first. So I applied mm -hmm. for a Fox News internship and I got it. 
and I came up here and so every week we would have a class for the University of Miami and a group of like 12 of us would come together after our week-long internship at where, wherever, David Letterman, NBC, and Fox, and we would talk about our experience and also speak with um, te- you know, other people in the industry. It was a really invaluable experience. That summer I worked here uh, in the HR department. Uh, I was put in the, there was like this little closet in the HR department where the interns worked on, um, it was awesome. We worked on this website called FNCU for the interns and it allowed me to actually shoot video and packages and speak to people. Um, And that showed Fox that I could actually do the job. And there was sort of an interesting moment there where they realized, wow, this kid can actually do a little reporting and do a little editing. And I'll never forget my first day, I ended up working with, um, in the middle of the, my internship, I asked to work with Shepard Smith's show, mm-hmm. and Michael Jackson died that mm-hmm. day. And I worked like 19 hours that day, and it was a big day for me. And ever since then, they'd always remembered me as the, the guy that was here when Michael Jackson died. And I helped book cars and gave the breaking news to, to Shepard, and it was a really big day and big moment for me. At the end of that internship, they offered me a job, and they said, when you graduate from college, we want you to come back. And, um, and I did. Most people, I major in journalism too, most people in journalism, you write fake news stories or you just walk around town and say, what kind of news do you have? You found yourself at a organization, a news place where breaking news happened all the time, real stuff. When you were thrown into the Michael Jackson story, what was going through your mind? Was it a rush of excitement or were you just like, what the heck is this? Yeah, it was, it was nerve wracking. Like the first, I mean, that was just cool to be there. I was a fly on the wall. I mean, as, as an intern, you just want to stay out of the way as much as you can, but you also want to help. So that was just a big moment to just see how the process was done. TMZ was just sort of coming out and being a big thing when that happened. And we were looking at TMZ breaking the news of Michael Jackson's death in 2009 and um, just seeing the buzz in the newsroom and seeing Shep's team, which is the best in the business, come together and deliver that news was a, a big moment for me where I said, wow, this is what I really want to do. Um, the adrenaline goes up and you stay focused and you just try to help as much as you can, even if my role at the time was just to print work out and maybe give some information when I could. but and book people's cars home. It felt cool to be part of a team. And that's what I love so much about this industry is that it's it's really a one big team effort, you know? When most people, when they graduate college, especially in a creative field, they really don't know what's going to happen next. But you left the University of Miami <clears throat> with the game plan. How did that make you feel? <sighs> You know, I guess it, it, I'm glad it seemed like a game plan. But <laughs> hey, it was more than I had. <laughs> I think people say when you graduate from college in broadcast journalism, the first thing they tell you is you need to go to a local station and work in the middle of nowhere and yeah. gain your experience. And when I came here that summer, I didn't expect to have a job offer for the year that I graduated. They offered me a job for foxnewslatino.com, which is a website we had here. And I was like, well, do I really want to work for a website? when I really want to be on TV. And I decided to make the decision that it was best for me to go for two years, I told myself, come to Fox, learn how to write for the web, become a good reporter here, um, because the web is everywhere. And that's, you know, there's a lot of TV reporters that don't know how to write for the web, gain a new skill set, And at the same time, maybe, you know, we'll see what happens. But I felt like I was going to go to school for two years and get paid for it. And that's how I, that's what I told myself. And um, after two, two and a half years, um, my big break happened and Pope Francis was chosen and I was sent to Italy and um, to cover for foxnewslatino.com and wouldn't you know the very first Pope chosen from Latin America ever was chosen that t- that trip and I was asked to um, do a hit with Shepard Smith that night. So my first time on television after college was the night the Pope was chosen. I'm on the roof of the Rome Bureau with Shepard Smith and he tossed to me and I spoke and to this day I have yet to see that clip. Uh, because it's just too nerve wracking to see. Um, I remember being done with it. Uh, I hadn't slept in like 36 hours and I just like cried a little bit after because I thought that I had, my life had come to an end. (laughs) I thought I did so badly. (laughs) And then uh, I did his inauguration the next day and then came back here and they offered me a contract. And I went from working for Fox News Latino to being on TV and I was 25 years old at the time. A lot to unpack here. I think my first question is, when you started that job right out of college at Fox News Latino, did you feel a crazy amount of pressure to succeed, to prove yourself? Were you nervous every day at work? Or did you just say, we'll see what happens, and when it's over, we'll figure it out? I don't think there's anything that can prepare you for your first job out of college. I don't know if there's a course I took that would have prepared me 
for that feeling of coming into the workplace and feeling um, just so young and uh, a little bit out of the element. Mm-hmm. So I was, it was really getting used to moving into and living in a city by myself, obviously, and then um, getting used to the job. That was a big transition for us. But for Fox News Latino, I thought it was a lot of fun because we were building a website together. And it was interesting to see how it's done from the ground up. I took it upon myself to make sure that I didn't want to just kind of cower behind that. And so I kind of talked and gave my ideas and said, whatever, why not? We're all part of the team. And I didn't really see my age as a hindrance. So I, um, you know, maybe I did a little bit too much talking sometimes, but I would give my ideas and my opinions like the rest of them. And that's a credit to the team here that made me feel comfortable enough to do that. I learned a lot in those first few years here making mistakes, but also having the opportunity to do some really great work. So, you know, I took the chance. That was the whole point about coming to New York City was to take the chance to come here for a couple of years, do something that wasn't, um, do something that was a little out of the ordinary and challenge myself. Did you have a backup plan if things didn't go out the way you uh, wanted them to? The backup plan was to immediately put together a tape, maybe go back home and go work at a station in somewhere that would accept me that was my backup plan um but i i figured if i could hit a home run in new york city at fox then there's a chance that good things could happen you know you mentioned big break in 2013 when the pope thing happened i don't know how i feel about the term big break because yeah that was your moment where you were the rust on camera in front of everybody but you worked your butt off before that what kind of preparation did you do to prepare for that big moment You're right. I think there's a whole life that happens before you have a moment that you consider sort of the quote unquote big break. I think you're right. I think it is really cliche. But um, I think uh, I was sent there at the University of Miami and everything. I always felt like I needed to have be a jack of all trades. Mm -hmm. I didn't know where this industry was going to go because especially with TV and broadcasting, it is constantly evolving. So I felt like I needed to have all the skill sets, somebody who could shoot, write, edit, be a reporter. Uh, do it all. And so when they sent me to Italy, the reason why they sent me was because I had a conversation um, and I told them that, you know, I I was thinking about leaving. And they said, well, you know, there's an opportunity at the time leadership here that we think you would love to go to Italy to cover the Pope. And we're sending you because you're sort of the jack of all trades. Why were you going to leave? I was going to leave because I thought it was time for me to go get live television experience. At the end of the day, there's nothing that makes up for actually doing the thing you want to do. So at some point I realized that I had learned how to do all the skill sets of writing already. I had gained what I wanted to gain out of the web. But at the end of the day, there is nothing that's going to replace what it's like to be live, what your body goes through, like physiologically and just like psychologically, what it's like for the camera to turn on and for you to go live. And I felt like I needed that. I felt like it was time. And when they sent me to Italy, they, the reason why they sent me was because I was a jack of all trades. They only had to send me. I was one person for Fox News Latino. And I was running around Italy with a camera and a notepad and putting together stories by myself. And I think, you know, that was a whole education and a life before that that allowed me for them to send me there. And then when I went live, I just, you know, I don't know. I blacked out. Honestly, I don't know what, <laughs> what happened. I, I get but, that. I get but it that. was it was just a big moment. I hadn't slept a lot. I couldn't believe it. And I just was so consumed afterwards that I was just like, my God, I hope I just didn't. I hope that went okay. Like, I hope yeah. it wasn't terrible. But, you know, you're stepping up to the plate. I don't know much about baseball, but I'm <laughs> guessing that it's like when the bases are loaded, there's two outs. Oh, no. And it's going to go wrong. <laughs> and the person steps up to the to bat you are, it's the moment. You have everything against you. How did you in that first moment say, I have to focus, I have to get through this? What kind of speech did you give yourself? What did you do to push forward in that moment? Well, I just think I I told myself there's like no backing down. I think you kind of, I had this freak out moment a little bit before. I even wrote a Facebook status was like, I'm a, I think I, I feel like I'm about to puke going on. I think I said that. I said, I know I said that. I feel like I'm about to puke going on TV. See you at you know, 10 o'clock Eastern time. Um, And people were having fun with that. They're like, oh, you're going to be fine. But I I was, um, I was going through it. I was too tired to really think about it too much. I just had to go. But I knew that this was a moment. And so to, I had to slow things down. So I just tried to take a deep breath, slow things down a little bit 
and concentrate on just generally what I was going to say. But at the end of the day, it's about just having confidence that no matter what, you know, you're going to be okay and just sort of, you know, just go up there and talk. And that's what happened. Um, my very first live at Attic College was a big moment and I just sort of slowed down and spoke and um, trusted myself. And that was a big test for me to trust yourself that, all right, here we go. Mm -hmm. um, so I, yeah, I just, I convinced myself that um, this was a moment that was really, really important and that there was no other option but to show up. What happened after that moment? After the Pope, you got back here, you came back to Fox News, what happened? Well, after the Pope, they let me do his inauguration. So I went, I did about an hour and a half right there in, the, in Rome with uh, Greg Jarrett and a priest back here in New York. And I was on the roof of the Rome Bureau and we did an hour and a half for all the local stations. And so I had just gone from speaking for like a minute and a half to now having to speak for an hour and a half. And um, I'll never forget Mario, who works at Fox and the Rome Bureau, and he stood with me next to me on the roof and was like cheering me on and being a champion for me. And that was so important for me at that age to have somebody who believed in me right next to me and who I felt like I could have as a, as a crutch just in case. Uh, but I came back and that went decent and that went well. And I came back and they offered me a contract to be a reporter on TV on the weekends and still do dot com for three days a week. So it would be a dual job. But essentially, I would start, you know, I went there in March and I would start on television at Fox in July. How did that make you feel? Um, I was really hesitant. I was actually going to say no, which, you know, in hindsight, when you think about it, why would you say no to the like the biggest opportunity? You probably are you crazy. But I had a lot of things go through my head at the time. I was just, you know, 24 going on 25. And my whole thought process was I don't deserve this is what I told myself. One. Two, I told myself, do you really want to say yes to this job? And if you make a mistake, you're not just making a mistake on like some channel in the middle of nowhere. You're making a mistake on the highest rated cable channel in the country. It's a mistake that will follow you for the rest of your career. Are you really ready for this? Um, so, and the third thing I told myself was, you know, Brian, maybe you need to go to local TV, gain the experience like everybody else, and then come back and be prepared. And then finally, after going back for a couple like a couple of weeks, I told myself, I went to the baseball analogy. I said, you know what? When you're a baseball player in the minor leagues and the New York Yankees call you up to come play, do you tell the Yankees, hey, no, I think I, I think I need a little bit more time in the minor leagues. No, when the Yankees came calling, you have to say yes. So I, so yeah, ultimately that's what told me to sign and just have faith in myself and um, take the step and just and just do it. It's interesting because people always think that the moment they get what they've been working so hard for, they'll wrap their arms around it, they'll be happy, but a, a lot goes through your head and the first thing is, I don't deserve this, or I'm not good enough for this, or I have fooled everybody up until this moment, what's going to happen now? Yeah. But just like you said, you have to take a step back and think to yourself, i got to give this a try and i got to give everything I have to it. And it's amazing that at 24, you were able to do that. Yeah. You have covered everything from the World Cup, Hurricane Sandy, a Super Bowl, a lot of politics. What is it like being able to cover such a wide variety of topics from really exciting like a Super Bowl to something really horrible like a shooting? It is, you know, the reason why I got in this is because every single day is different. And now more than ever, it really does feel that way. Every single day is different. I find it exciting. You have to be someone who's able to deal with the constant change of a schedule or the constant stress of going and helicoptering into a story like the church shooting in Texas mm -hmm. where people were gunned down. I mean, whole families lost generations and to come into a small town, um, speak to people about the worst moment in their lives and then report that and then get on a plane and come back, you know, and then somehow the next day talk about maybe President Trump or talk about, I don't know, New Year's Eve celebration the next day, it can get taxing because, you know, these are human beings you're yeah. talking about. So I love the fact that my job every single day is different. I love the fact that my job is to speak to people and to just be a normal human being on television, to be authentic as to how it feels and what it's like to have gone through this experience. I think now more than ever, especially 
with people who are so numb, we're all numb to all the news that's coming at us. It's so important that when you actually go and report on a story that you try to just be as human as possible and show people what it's like to, as best as you can, what it feels like to be in that moment. You know, this isn't just another shooting. This is a family that lost the grandmother and the grandson and the, you know, and, and so forth. Um, so, you know, my mom's always worried about me. She thinks that somehow she's like, are you okay? Do you need to speak to somebody about all the things you see from a hurricane to the shooting to this? And no, I, I think, um, she has a little bit of a point in the sense of, you know, I think it's a fair question to ask. I think all reporters, mm -hmm. we do have to go in this and you, you immerse yourself in the worst moments in people's lives a lot of times. Um, so I've learned a lot about having to take care of myself too and making sure you're ready to do it the next day. Um, you're always on call, especially now. I didn't really feel fully expect that, um, I guess, when I was in college. But you're always on call. We are like, you know, it's like feast or famine. Some days you're not really doing much but reading and keeping track. Other days you're working 12 days straight and you're, you're on a story. So you always have to be ready. How has being able to be there for some people's worst day of their lives affected how you personally live your life? <sighs> you know, um, be where you are. Be in the moment. I just think we, we, we stress so much about the past and the future, but at the end of the day, the only thing you're guaranteed is the now. And when you go and you see these families um, how resilient they are. I think that's the biggest thing. When I went to Puerto Rico after this hurricane and you spoke to families who had lost everything or were leaving their entire families behind to come move to the mainland United States and start their lives again, and you see it in their eyes and you're walking through their homes that they had just lost, you see resilience, right? You can. It really inspires you to say, you know what? Wow. One, like what really matters in life, which is, which is the now it's, it's not, it's not the things, it's not even your job. It's, yeah. it's, it's your family, it's love, it's people. So that's the other thing. And two, resilience. I mean, people are just so resilient. I don't know how I would feel to have my child gunned down in the Parkland shooting. And I mean, it's just un un unexplainable, right? So inexplicable, um, but to see how people are able to somehow find light in that darkness is um, is incredible. And I hope, God forbid, if anything horrible were to happen in my life or in moments where I feel low, I remember the people in Puerto Rico. I remember the people in Texas. I remember the people who've lost their homes and livelihood mm -hmm. and somehow are able to smile with you and have a conversation and tell you things are going to be okay. Um, so that's the biggest takeaway when you go speak to people. Um, it really is amazing how resilient people are. When you show up to these places like Puerto Rico or that place in Texas, what do people think when you show up with the camera and you're wearing a suit and you have a job to do? Are they happy to see you because they want to get their story out or are they almost like, can you please just leave us alone? I think sometimes it really all depends on how you go and do it. I think it's all about, you know, hopefully you're not wearing a suit in the heat in Puerto Rico, but you know, it's just about being a person. My God, this job is just about being as authentic as you can. People don't want to see, um, a person acting like a news reporter. They just want to see a person who's talking to another human being who just lost everything. And I always keep that in mind. These are just people. We're all just people. So I'll go usually come up and, you know, I try to go without the camera first. I try to go up there and establish who I am. I say sorry for their loss. Um, I explain to them why I'm there and why it is I feel like it's so important I speak to them. And I always make sure that they realize that I understand that this is like a very tough moment in their life and they don't have to speak with me but I really think it would be important for people to realize what's really going on here and that usually you know that, that works this is why I think you're so good at your job is because you understand people you really deep down to your core care about people and I don't think a lot of people out there are like this I'm not gonna speak on behalf of all news reporters I don't know but I, I do feel if I was in this position I might feel that pressure of being just so hungry to get a story that I might forget about the person. 
I would claim to be your biggest fan, but <laughs> I know a lot of people listening would put up a fight, including my own mom and dad, who, <laughs> when they found you were coming on, were beside themselves. With I am really popular with parents and people <laughs> over the age of 60. I don't know what Both it is. But... Tone, Florida <laughs> has a place in their heart for you. I, my parents watch you religiously yeah. every week they send me pictures of you on tv i'm like i know brian's on tv even my own mother stopped taking photos of me on tv she's yeah. over it she's like yeah i don't blame her but you have a ton of fans i appreciate i've that. watched a lot of what you do but one of the stories i saw you report on in 2016 through facebook live is something that haunts me to this day it was the orlando shooting yeah. You did the Facebook Live story for about 20 minutes where on the story you told one story about each of the 49 victims. I have no idea how you were able to keep your composure throughout because it was just, I rewatched it a couple days ago and was like, oh my goodness, this is just so hard to see. But when you're covering a story like that, that is so close to both of our hearts because it's in our state, you know, we, I went to school in Orlando, we know people in Orlando. Regardless, it's human beings who lost their life while they were living their life, not doing anything wrong. What was that like for you to cover that story? It, um, I could not go to Orlando to cover it. And I really desperately wanted to go and cover the story. Um, not only because I feel like a Floridian, but man, it was just a story that hit me personally very personally and I you know as a news reporter you need to separate yourself from stories mm -hmm. but in this case it was really hard to not see myself and the 49 people who died you know I am a gay Hispanic person mm -hmm. and most of these people were gay Hispanic guys in their 20s like myself mm -hmm. who were just having a good time and had their lives just taken from them it felt um, really also important to me because of where they died. They died in a place where they were supposed to feel the safest. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it was an attack on just, um, it felt like an attack on me and my family and people that are like me. And so I felt like it was really important that if I couldn't go down to Orlando, I would... Um, do something to recognize that these people weren't just 49 gay, lesbian, LGBTQ mm -hmm. members of the community, but they were human beings with stories. Yeah. And that was uh, really important to me. So I, I went over to Fox and I asked them if they if we could do a um, – at Fox News Latino, we did a uh, Facebook Live conversation. Mm -hmm. um, not a conversation, but just a, a, in memoriam. And we had all the photos of every single person who died and we spoke about um, – pulse and then we gave a uh, detail to humanize these people i was just tired of everybody being a number um and so i felt like uh, again if people feel as though that they can see themselves just like i saw myself in these people there's something about their stories that could reflect with them you know that could really resonate with people then they could maybe make a small difference so we went into the studio and it was one of the toughest things i've ever actually had just had to do uh we did it live um and to keep it together was a difficult thing to do, um, but I felt like it was just really important. And so um, I just kept reminding myself that, um, you know, this wasn't the time to, to break down. This was the time to do something and for to remind people of how important these folks are. You, I think, do a great job on the news because you show emotion, but just enough emotion, right? So you're not blank with no emotion reading something off a teleprompter, but you're not crying. You are always just enough. I feel like that takes a lot of mental strength. How do you think you've been able to walk into these stories and use that mental strength to almost put a block on your emotions so that you don't stand in front of the camera and cry? Or on the flip side, something crazy and funny happens that you don't just start hysterically laughing. <laughs> you know, how do you keep it together and be so professional? Um, I just think it's just with um, with anything, just doing it. And that's why I said with the with the being on um, on TV. I think if you really want to do something. Um, you have to just actually go and do it. I think for a long time I was sort of um, – when I first started here, I thought that I could maybe you know, learn how to be a reporter just like they do on TV and not have to actually be in front of the camera when the light's on. But again, I think it's one of those things that just comes with time. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of different things that go through your mind when you're live on television when you first start out. Oh my god, don't mess up. Oh my god, how do I sound? 
you have to find the process that works for you. Uh, so for me, uh, starting off the first few weeks and the first few you know year or two, I had to figure out a way to uh, get the process down right. Like my heart was racing um, for a lot of my live hits before, when I first started. How do you slow down your heart rate? It's just by doing it and calming yourself down. You realize also that um, if you keep thinking about not wanting to make a mistake, you're forgetting the whole purpose of doing your story. So I stopped thinking about the fear of making a mistake and started thinking about the importance of delivering a story the right way and just like sticking to what I think is right. And when you just, I always just remind myself that we're just two people having a conversation. And it's okay if I mistake a word or say something that's not exactly perfect in terms of flubbing my word. As long as you just keep going and having a conversation like we are right now. I hope um, you write a memoir one day called Two People Having a Conversation. <laughs> that's <laughs> a terrible... That a lot, <laughs> Sorry. I like it. I, no, I like but it. it's true. I mean, you know, I think it is when it, it's tough when you like talk to a camera all day. Um, it's important to remember that there's a person there, um, you know, l looking at you, listen, listening to you, so... How do you stay humble? You've gotten so far in your career. You're on TV, which to some people would say that makes you famous, that makes you well known, it makes you all these things. How do you stay humble? Um, this job humbles you a lot uh, every single day. You are learning something every single day, which is a great thing as to why I chose this industry. I come into work every day and I'm like, okay, what is it new that I have to learn? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, especially being a general assignment reporter, I'll have to talk about economics one day and I know nothing about what's happening in a certain industry or the next day I'll come in and I have to uh, look at a shooting that happened in Michigan and I have to call police and figure out different things or I have to go through a court case. Um, you know, in a different state. And I'm like, you know, what are the rules and, and the laws in this case? Every single day is different. So I'm always just open myself to feedback mm -hmm. and to um, and to learning because I realize that the best people in this industry are those who have experienced sort of the most things. And I realize that in the grand scheme of things, I'm not even 30 years old yet. And I've got a lot to learn about life. Like, you know, I'm not married yet. I don't have kids. Um, you know, I think those are things in life that actually can affect your reporting as you get older. You know, there are things in life experiences I still have to go through that will actually affect how I think about different stories and how people think about it. So I constantly remind myself that this is just the beginning and there are people who've been doing this for 40, 50 years like Shepard Smith and Brett Baer and um, who've been doing it for 30, 40 years, you know, and I've got a long way to go. So it's it's exciting. It's just the beginning. A question from one of our listeners. Looking at the ups and downs of your career, what's one piece of advice you wish you heard when you were first starting out? Not everyone is going to like you, and that's okay. I uh, think I graduated from high school, obviously, and then college, and you're like, hey, you know, I was homecoming king. You know, that was pretty cool. Like, you come out, you're like, best all around. Hey, it's good to have all these great friends. Oh, my God. The real life is just... Um, it, that doesn't matter to be most liked. Yeah, but by Brian, everybody. who doesn't like? Yeah, you? but that's not. I don't know no, one person. No, 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 no. It's not about that though. Like, it's you, not. But no, like you can't go around and thinking that you can just go around and be like, you know, um, that your goal is somehow to be all things to everyone. You're not going yes. to be all things to everyone. Amen. And I think in the workplace and in your personal life, the quicker you realize that, the better it is for you. Yeah. You got to just be you. Some people aren't going to be okay with that, but that's not your issue. Yeah. That's theirs. And I think especially in this job too, whether, you know, what you report on and, you know, people on Twitter and Facebook can say some nasty things. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, it's, that's on them, Yeah. you know, and that's not on you. And I think I learned coming out of college that um, it really, you really need to uh, take care of me, myself and I. Uh, so that you can prepare yourself for the world that's out there and realize that you are enough and not everybody needs to like you, but that you are enough for yourself. And um, I agree. and I think that was the biggest thing for me. I so caught up with people trying to be all things to everyone that you forget. You lose your own happiness. I love that. Yeah. A handful of years ago, we went to dinner in Times Square and midway through eating, you said you had something you wanted to tell me. <laughs> oh, no. And you told me that you were gay. Yeah. And I remember that moment because I just remember feeling 
really like not a big change of emotions. I was like, <laughs> that's great, Brian. You know, I, I didn't feel shocked. I didn't feel different towards you. I loved you the same way. I've always loved you. But I know that that moment was really hard for you. What was it like to come out to your friends and your family a couple of years ago? 2015 was a really hard year. Um, coming into New York City uh, is tough by yourself when you come in in 2000. I came here in 2010. And over the course of those years, I figured out a lot of things about myself. I was so fearful that I would lose my family and friends. And I, I think um, – I know it sounds silly, I guess, to some people, but um, I didn't want to disappoint people. And I think it goes back to not everyone's going to like you. I was so worried that this was going to change my image with my, my bros from Whispering Pines and Eagles Landing all the way through high school, the guys I've grown up with, to my father, to my family, to my friends. So um, I came to realize in 2015 um, who I was. And I thought it was important. I had a decision to make um, to keep it sort of a secret or not. And I thought it was just how could I do my job as an authentic human being if I can't even be authentic to myself? And so I thought that it was important to tell my friends. And I wanted to tell my friends first. Not all of them, but just a few. Because I felt like if I could protect myself with my friends, then I could protect myself from whatever reaction my family would have. And so that's why I told you and friends first because I figured it would be a, a nice buffer <laughs> just in case my family rejected me. And of course, my family did not at all. Yeah. But it, And my family's great. And I told my sister first and my sister who's five years younger than me was like, you know, she told me here in New York, she was just like, and, you know, mm-hmm. you're, we love you just the same. Yeah. Told my mother, told my dad via Skype. That was a fun conversation. He was great too. Um, he was in DR and I just felt like I had to tell him. It was uh, such a big pivotal moment in my life, um, and I've been the happiest I've ever been since I finally just figured it out, you know. Um, and now I can just work on being who I really am, and um, I think it's finally allowed for real love to come into my life now too for the first time, and that's uh, in terms of a uh, relationship, and that's the most uh, that's that's a great gift of it all. Um, I fully recognize though it's not easy. For a lot of people, Mm -hmm. which is also why you and I, I guess, are having this conversation now. You know, I'm a TV reporter, you know. Not only Um, that, but you work for a very conservative channel, yet you stand by your identity. So what has that meant to you to be able to do that? I think it's meant a lot to me that this company, um, you know, which has a news division and an opinion division and the opinion division is, is, um, you know, is what they, is, it is what they say on prime time. But in terms of the news division, they allow us to just do our jobs. And the people here have been family for me since the very beginning. Yep. And you know what? The best responses I've had, people here just don't care. It's not a thing. Yeah. It's just not a thing. They care about your reporting and how great your story was. And so for me to be accepted here, I think it's it's great. It's been it's been absolutely amazing here. I think it does though send a message. I think for me to be a brown gay Hispanic reporter at the Fox News Channel and for me to put my face on television, not that I have to wave a flag and tell people that I am all the time. I don't. It's really none of their business. I my whole thing is I uh, you know we'll talk about my relationship. If I know about your relationship, but I do think that that there is. It's not lost on me. I've had people tell me that there's there is power. I think for people that look like me. Mm -hmm. Um, who are younger than me, who aren't blessed to have the family and friends around them, who may be struggling with coming out or figuring out who they are. And I think if they can turn on the news and see somebody that looks like them um, and has had similar experiences, I think there's power in that. So again, it's, um, I think that's the decision. That's, uh, that's the mentality that's made me, uh, that's given me courage to come out and talk about my personal life because I just think that there are a lot of people who haven't been as blessed as me and um, they deserve to know that it gets better and that people can support you. You are such a good role model for so many people, old, young, our age, and the fact that you are honest about yourself, which I know was hard, probably makes you feel like there's a huge weight off of your shoulders, right? I mean, I, I bet you after you came out, you felt like you could take a deep breath and live your life. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, there was a huge weight off of my shoulders. Um, not that I was hiding it my whole life. I think it was more of a, for me, it was more of a coming to, coming into like realizing what it, this was, mm -hmm. you know. Um, <clears throat> and now I feel like I'm authentically myself. And I think it's, it's, it translates on television, but it also just translates in everything in my life. Um, I think that there, there's no coincidence that I have found the love of my life in Kyle. Who is awesome. I awesome. vouch for that. Boyfriend <laughs> of the century. <laughs> but there, it's no surprise that I found him during the time in which I have felt most true to myself. Mm -hmm. You know, we all have these dating things, and obviously, especially in, in the gay community, it can be really rough out there. Um but I think it's no coincidence that um, it all happened at a time where I just sort of concentrated on myself and my own happiness mm. first. That I attracted people who were just like that yes. as opposed to constantly looking out there for validation. And it's a really tough thing out there, especially working in television. Are you kidding me? I mean, you know, you put yourself out there every single day. Um, for criticism, the way you look, the way you are in the gay community is is a very difficult community too with that. Um, just like it is in, 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 in all communities, but particularly the gay community. Um, so I just felt like it was really imp an important step for me to just put me, myself, and I first. Love myself, know who I am, and then all things sort of came from that. And when you come from that place, mm -hmm. there's a lot of power in that. I'm happy you did because I really feel like you're living the best version of your life. And I can say that because I've known you yeah. many versions of your life. I just want to end this interview yeah. real quick with a fast lightning round. Oh, and no. I ask you some questions and feel free to answer them with whatever comes to mind. Are okay. you ready? Let's do it. What advice would you give yourself at age 22 graduating from college? You are enough. What advice would you give yourself now that you wish you would actually listen to? Hmm. It's not personal. <laughs> not everything is personal. What's the best advice anyone has ever given you? Be where you are. What's the number one thing you want to accomplish this year? Make my new apartment, uh, create a new home. Uh, we just got a new apartment, so create, make that apartment feel like a new home. I hope there's room for me there. <laughs> <laughs> there is. Okay, I'm happy to hear that. <laughs> Tell us about one of your moments of failure and how you kept pushing forward. Woo. Uh, there was a story that um, uh, I was duped on. Uh, the person I did the story on, um, it ended up, the whole thing ended up being fraudulent. But um, it was a very difficult time for me professionally because as a reporter, I had to take responsibility for that and um, you know apologize and fall on the sword for, 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 for that. And so for me, it was a very difficult time for me professionally and personally. Um, but I learned a lot about the fact that you just have to double, triple, quadruple check. Yep. And, um, and uh, you know, at the end of the day, when you make a mistake, you need to take responsibility for it. And things are better after that. So that was a big moment for me uh, professionally. It taught me a lot about trusting people and making sure you do your job uh, extra. You've got to be extra careful on the way that things are moving now with news so fast. Ready for this one? Yeah. Fill in the blank. You're not getting any younger. So... Do, be, and love. That's my thing. I love it, Brian. Thank you so yeah. much. Where can our listeners find you if they want to stalk you and become your new best friend? <laughs> uh, go to Facebook, Brian Yenis, or you can just get me on Instagram, B-L-L-E-N-A-S. Find me there. Or on Twitter at Brian Yenis, at Brian Yenis. And you can stalk me and we can... No, don't stalk me. Just send me a message. We can have a conversation. That's fine, right? Two people just having a conversation. That's the takeaway, Jen. And when you watch him on Fox News, you will absolutely <laughs> adore him and never want to change the channel. I'm sure your, par your parents and your grandparents have they seen me. Or you probably you. see me at the gym while you're running. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Say right. hi. Thank you so much, Brian. Thank you so much, Jen. Hey, you. Thank you for listening to the You're Not Getting Any Younger podcast. There are hundreds of thousands of pods out there, so thank you for listening to this one. You can find the show notes for this week's episode up on our website, anyyounger.com. Subscribe, rate, and review that you're not getting any younger podcasts on iTunes so that other ears around the world can listen too. Oh, and join our secret You're Not Getting Any Younger Facebook group, where over 1,000 people are talking about how to disrupt their lives for good reason, to make it count. Until next week, all my love, Jen Glantz.